how do I even start this video? I think I need to just put it in the title, what this is about, because I can't even say the words right now. I genuinely was at the point where I did not think that I would be back here doing these videos about this topic. I've put up a few, I don't know, three videos or something since the cancer videos. Um, and I've said that, I don't know, I don't know what to, I don't know what to put out there. People ask me for, you know, updates and videos and I'm kind of like, I'm a really boring person. I don't know what to, what to create. <laughs> so anyway, I'm back. So it is 2023 and I am now five years post cancer treatment. Um, this year has been my healthiest year yet. And by that, I mean mainly my mental health. For years, like so many people, I've been, I had been living that really where you're kind of just waiting for the cancer to come back. You're kind of living in a, what's the point? I don't know, kind of world. Obviously, being on anti-hormonal treatment really changes you as a person. It changes how your head works, the things that you say, and so much. I didn't deal with a lot of things after treatment, um, you know, trauma, my thoughts, a lot. And it led to me just really reckless behavior, you know, with, with everything, with myself, with my health, with my relationships with people, with everything. Um, and at the start of this year, I went to therapy. And it was obviously not my first time going to therapy, but it was the first time where I was completely honest with my therapist. And she was amazing. Probably, I think, the best there is. <laughs> so honestly, like I'm in a really good headspace. I have been in a really good headspace all year. I. I'm happy, I feel like I have a purpose again, you know, so much. Not to like brag or anything. So with that being said, I am so grateful that I made this year the year to be my healthiest self um, and to be mentally as healthy as I have ever been because if I wasn't well mentally right now, I would not have the headspace to process any of this. I literally would not have space in my head to get my head around this. I'm happy right now. I, I am happy. So I remember it was, it was months ago, but I turned, I was with my mom and I turned to my mom a really, really, um, I, I'm gonna cry. <sighs> One sec. A really, um, a really bad thing was happening at the time. A really sad thing was happening at the time. But <clears throat> I felt con content in myself, and I was happy with how I was mentally equipped to deal with that situation, and I recognized that. And I turned to my mum and said. I'm really happy right now, which was probably really inappropriate to say at the time, but I think she said something like, I know, or I can tell or something like that, you know? So, and like that, I've had a lovely year. So me saying all of that is explaining that I feel like I'm really well equipped right now to deal with what comes next. Okay, right, let's talk about it now. Okay, so I didn't go in with that I'd found something or I was having symptoms or anything like that. I routinely saw my oncologist, that was 12 weeks ago. I walked out of that office that day 
so happy. I'm not sure my oncologist ever saw me smile before that day. <laughs> I had made this great plan with her um, and it was all dependent on my CT scan being clear. I went along with my plan, assuming everything is going to be fine. It's always fine. And um, yeah, things were moving along nicely until that CT scan was not clear. And so the next thing was to get a bone biopsy done. Um, and then at that time, the um, radionuclide bone scan was, was booked as well, which I actually haven't had that done yet, but I'll be doing that next week. Anyway, I had the bone biopsy done. And um, when that result came back, it was as expected. Um, it was cancerous and specifically it was my old friend breast cancer the estrogen receptor positive and her two neg um breast cancer that i had before so it was not it's not a new primary cancer it is secondary so um i don't have bone cancer i have breast cancer which is metastasized to the bone so i now have stage four cancer <laughs> for some people i suppose for a lot of people who especially if they haven't had cancer um don't really have the need to go and be kind of researching this kind of thing so they don't really understand staging and why it becomes stage four and why it becomes incurable actually nobody does that's why cancer is incurable <laughs> but yeah because i was already stage three um the cancer had already infiltrated the lymphatic system which means that it could and in my case did travel to distant places um in the body and lie dormant until for whatever reason um it manages to escape dormancy and um enter the cell cycle again i'm gonna explain it in like a really simple way <laughs> Okay, so imagine it like this, okay? Cancer is this like huge group of people in a subway station and they're all wearing black hoodies and they're acting the maggot and they're like, they're trouble, everybody knows, okay? But the place is packed. The subway station is packed, the subways are packed and somehow some of them, they duck down, they run over and they managed to get on that. They got on that train. So at some stage, someone notices that they, they saw them, they saw them on the train and they, they say, listen, I'm after seeing those, those black hoodie cancer guys on that train. So the powers that be say, right, what we're going to do is we're going to release poison. It's going to go into the, the stations. It's going to go onto the train. Okay. And listen, only the black hoodies will die. The rest of you, like you might be a bit sick, but we get rid of all those black hoodies. So people cut their losses and they go, yeah, okay, fine. Let's do that. So that's chemo, okay? So they release this poison in, but that subway already stopped five times at different stations. And nobody knows did any of those black hoodies get off. So if they did, and they didn't leave the station, the poison will still get them. But if they left the station, there's nothing we can do about it. So if any of them did manage to get off and leave the station and go out, they can just lay low for years until they feel like they can come back out in public and nobody is going to know about it. And what's more is once they wake up, they want a friend so they just go bloop, and they there's two of them and then bloop, suddenly there's three and it's like <gasps> they multiply and, and that's that's metastases so what's next um well the first thing is i'll be getting that bone scan done so it's not it's not this tuesday uh, it's not this tuesday it's next tuesday that will show better um basically all the places in the bones um, that the cancer 
might be and um, better than the CT imaging can. In terms of treatment, I've already started back on the Zoladex. There'll also be letrozole, ribocyclib and um, zoledronic acid infusions. There'll be regular scans to monitor growth and to look at the other organs and yeah the plan is just to take it as it comes so i said this already that on instagram i just i described it as august being a month of scanxiety i say it like this that it's almost like that month of scanxiety was a necessary evil because it gives you oh i'm sorry I'm, i feel sick thinking about it now it's awful it's awful waiting is the worst part i said this the first time too it's so bad i would say that you know would it be nine let's say 90 percent. i was 90 percent sure that it was cancer and that it wasn't a primary bone cancer that it was the breast cancer had you know returned um but there was throughout the month that 10 percent of me that was saying maybe something else <laughs> and sometimes i could talk myself into you know well in my mind an awful place and then i could be like no but it might be okay and it might be i mean it has to be wrong one of the things i kept kind of saying to myself was i love my children way too much for this to be real because obviously i'm fine talking here now but there was a lot of crying last month and a lot of worrying about what will secondary school be like what will college be like what will the job market be like where are my kids gonna live are they gonna be you know i don't know how do they cope when they're so young if they lose their mom and i just thought no i love them too much that the love inside of me for them is gonna take over and get rid of whatever else was going on you jump from worst case scenario moments to best case scenario moments and <clears throat> i suppose all of those thoughts and processing those thoughts kind of like prepares you for when you actually do get the diagnosis i don't have an answer about how much time i have left but i know that it's beyond a couple of months so i'm not thinking okay like I need to get Christmas presents and uh, Christmas can't be crap for the kids and I need to write them letters for their older birthdays <laughs> and those immediate fear kind of things I can just I can take my time with all of those things all of those things that I do want to do and the stuff that is important to me the goals for my kids and then you know, during August, I made the decision that I wanted to continue living my life as normal as possible. I wanted to still be going to work and doing everything that I do. Um, and that actually should be possible because on a Monday and Tuesday, I work a half day and um, the uh, day ward clinic is on a Monday afternoon as anyway, so I can do that. I'm really hopeful that it's not going to interfere with things, um, you know, with my life, with being present for my children um, and, you know, working and everything. And like, it's important to me that I'm still putting in the work with them. Um, I don't want it to be a situation where, so I haven't actually spoken to them about it. I don't want them thinking of me as sick or fragile and being afraid to fight with me over bedtime or whatever it is. I don't want to be sitting around like twiddling my thumbs waiting for D-Day, you know. Uh, I know myself, I know I need the routine of life and um, I just know I'd be staying in bed all day. And um, God, I love you. 
Anyway, I would be staying in bed all day. I'd find excuses not to do things around the house. I wouldn't have motivation. I just know, I know myself and I know what I need. So look, that's the story. I guess now I am gonna be here a bit more often because I'm gonna document this again. I find it really therapeutic doing this because I can just sit here and ramble about, you know, just what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. And even if I edit like more than half of it out, I have still been able to feel like I've sat there and talked to somebody about it. And then there is the fact that after the other videos, people have told me how helpful they found them, that they found honesty, that they found comfort, whatever it is that they got from it. Me documenting everything helped other people. Last month I searched YouTube for so many of my panicky little questions and I found very little. So again, even if one day, even in a couple of years that somebody stumbles upon a video and they get an answer and they feel a little bit less alone or more prepared for what's to come or something, then the video will serve a purpose. So look, I'm gonna leave it at that. I am on Instagram. So Instagram is d.insta. I know I used to have a different name and in the old videos, I know that that's the name that I used, but somebody stole that. Someone, it's not me. Okay, so it's d.insta. Insta. Um, is the real me. So do all the things, do you know, like the video, subscribe and ring the bell so that you get a notification when I put up another video and you don't miss it. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!